Star clusters are fascinating objects and they give us a very powerful way to double check and test our theories of what's going on inside the stars and how nuclear fusion and all that, that works to make sure that we really understand that well. So, star clusters. All right, there are two types of star clusters. First of all, there are their open clusters. An open cluster of stars is within the disk of our galaxy, in disk of the Milky Way. Uh, this is a group of young stars that all form together. You're usually relatively young in terms of how stars live, and they all form together at the same time out of the same great big cloud of gas and dust. We figure when you when you make stars, you know, and you got a great big cloud of gas and dust, you don't make one star or two stars. No, you make hundreds or thousands at once. And so that's that's what we're looking at here. So so these are young stars which formed uh, together. And so that's what open clusters are. Over time, they're not held together by gravity, so over time an open cluster will tend to spread out over and get scattered throughout the galaxy. Probably our own sun formed in an open cluster somewhere, but you know, four and a half billion years later, the, the siblings of our sun are probably scattered all the way throughout the galaxy. So that's, that's what an open cluster is. And the other type of uh, star clusters are globular clusters. These are tightly bound balls of stars. This is a group of stars held together by gravity, and these are kind of sprinkled around the disk of our galaxy. They're kind of in the, in the halo of our galaxy. So a bound, they're bound together by gravity, bound by gravity. These are balls of stars. And these, theoretically, they could be of any age. They, in our galaxy, they tend to be fairly old. Um, so, open clusters, we're looking to hundreds, usually in the numbers of thousands of stars. And globular clusters, we're talking hundreds of thousands to millions of stars. Millions of stars, usually old, usually old type of stars. Um, and we'll talk about ages in just a second. So these are these are the two types of clusters of stars. We can see them both with a telescope. Globular clusters are nice and distinct when you're looking through a telescope, a tightly bound ball of stars. And then you got your open clusters, which are you know a little more diffuse, but sometimes you can see the gas and dust that the cluster formed from uh, the Pleiades, the, the seven sisters. The Pleiades cluster is up, up in the sky is a is an open cluster of stars and it still has this wispy gas sort of thing around there. So these are star clusters. So how do I use this to test our theory, so that's what we're doing, testing the theory of hydrogen to helium fusion in the cores of main sequence stars. Remember, okay, so our, our theory is that the reason why these stars are on the main sequence is this is controlled by doing hydrogen to helium fusion in there. So I say, take my, I say, all right, I'm going to consider a star with half the mass of the sun. And I take all the equations, I put them together, and I say, okay, theoretically, if this is doing nuclear fusion, hydrogen to helium in its core, then it should have this surface, surface temperature, and it should have this luminosity. And then I look up at the sky and I found that stars with that mass on the main sequence do indeed have that particular temperature and luminosity. So that makes me take this theory very seriously. When the numbers, the specific numbers, the exact surface temperature and the exact luminosity predicted theoretically by equations alone actually match up with the surface temperature and lum luminosity that I measure with my telescope, and they're the same numbers for, for the given mass, then I think, okay, now I have a clue. Is that good enough? No! Science demands that every theory that we have, we put it to a rigorous test in any way possible. We test it every way possible. And, and so this is another way we can do it. So we're testing the theory of hydrogen to helium fusion in main sequence stars. So here's what we can do. Based on you know, that theory, well, okay, what, what should happen to stars over time? We find that as they, over time, their, their, their cores turn from hydrogen into helium. And so eventually, a star is going to have a core of pure helium, and then it can't do hydrogen fusion anymore. So that means a star can't do this forever. Stars cannot shine forever. They have fuel. The fuel is hydrogen gas. It's turned into helium gas. Once it's all turned into helium gas, well, you got to do some other type of fusion or do something else, but you can't do that anymore. And the central idea of the, our theory of the main sequence is that these stars are all doing hydrogen to helium fusion in their cores. So you calculate that different stars can 
do hydrogen to helium fusion for different periods of time. Different stars which diff with different masses, stars with different masses will have the fuel, fuel will last for different amounts of time. So this, you might think, okay, if I have a star with twice the mass of the sun, double the amount of fuel that our sun has, you might think, well, that star should last twice as long. But it doesn't, and here's why. Because that star with double the mass of the sun has a different luminosity than the sun. Luminosity really is telling about me about the rate of nuclear fusion in there. If that star was, had, uh, let's see, it has twice as much fuel, but if its luminosity was twice as much as our sun, then it would burn through its fuel in the same period of time, and the stars would live to the same age before they leave the main sequence. Turns out that a star with double the mass of the sun has more than double the sun's luminosity. So as a result, that star with double the mass of the sun, even though it has twice as much fuel, is burning up its fuel way faster than our sun does, and so it's going to run out of fuel much faster. And we can calculate how long it would take to run out of fuel. I mean, we know the luminosity of the star. We know how much energy you get out from every nuclear fusion reaction turning hydrogen to helium. So you can figure, all right, you got this amount of fuel. You're burning your fuel at this rate. That's given by luminosity. Then you can calculate how long could this star last before it will die, before it will run out of fuel. So different stars, different masses. Fuel will last for different amounts of time. We can calculate what we call a main sequence lifetime. Calculate main sequence lifetime. Basically, we do this by taking the total fuel, total fuel, total amount of the mass available, the amount of mass in the core, divided by the burning rate, rate, which is, which can be figured out from luminosity. And based on this, we can calculate how long the fuel will last. And so when we do this, we can calculate that, all right, here's what's going to happen on the main sequence. Let's throw up, let's throw up an HR diagram, and we find that, okay, so here's temperature, here's luminosity, here's bright, here's faint, here faint, bright, here's hot, here's cool, cool, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. There's the main sequence, this band sort of thing like there. And what we do is we calculate that these really high mass stars, these hot stars, O stars, very, very luminous stars up here, 100 times the mass of the sun, they burn through their fuel amazingly fast. That those stars should last a very short lifetime, just, just a few millions of years. So short lifetime. Then as we move down the main sequence where the stars get smaller and smaller and smaller, they burn their fuel more and more slowly. So if we get to our sun, here's our sun, we calculate that our sun should have about 10 billion years on the main sequence. 10 billion years. So, okay, we know our solar system based on aging meteorites and stuff like that. Our solar system is about 4.5 billion years old. So our sun is about middle-aged. It's about halfway through its lifetime. And then these lower main sequence stars, these red dwarf stars, these very low luminosity, very cool stars, these will last for a very long time. Very long lifetime. Very, very long lifetime. So there should be this pattern on the main sequence. So again, okay, I need to test this. This is all theory. This is all totally mathematics and equations and physics and stuff like this. Is this true? Is this really the way our universe is? Here's what we do. I say, all right, if I have a bunch of stars which all form together at the same time out of the same cloud of gas, hey, that's a star cluster, then what will happen to it over time? And so what's going to happen? I can make a prediction now. I can say, aha. As I, what's going to happen is some of these stars are going to leave the main sequence after as they've run out of fuel. Now they can't do hydrogen fuel infusion. They're going to die. They're going to do other things. We'll talk about that later. But the, and which ones are going to leave? No, not these. This means that since these have very long lifetimes, it means everywhere you go, that you will always, every star cluster will have the lower main sequence. Those stars last forever, uh, almost, <laughs> ridiculously long periods of time. And these stars are going to last a short time, so they should leave the main sequence first. So here's my prediction. When I, plot, when I go measure a bunch of stars which are all in a star cluster together, so this thousand stars in an open cluster, what I should find is that the very youngest clusters should have a full main sequence. And then, 
as they get older, the left, you, should, you should lose the main sequence starting from the top and then going down and down and down and down. So what you would have here, let's draw, let's sketch out a few of these things. And so you would say for a young cluster, young, young cluster, you would have a full main sequence all the way. And then get you slight older, well, then those, those upper main sequence stars, there's O and B stars, should leave the main sequence, so you, you start losing that. And then as you go to older, even further older, that this main sequence should get shorter and shorter until a very, very old, a very old cluster should only have a little stump of a main sequence in there. Say it's, you know, it's so just, just the red dwarf stars. And that over time, that main sequence should erode down farther and farther down. That you would never have, based on this theory, I would predict, you will never have an upper end of the main sequence without a lower end of the main sequence, and that's true. And so, based on this, we, we start looking at star clusters and we find that this is true. This always works. Whenever you form a group of stars, you make a full main sequence of stars. You have some high mass stars and low mass stars. When you make stars, you make thousands of stars at once, at least, and so you always get a full main sequence of stars. And then when we look at this, we find that this prediction is right. There are no star clusters with only an upper end of the main sequence, but no lower end of the main sequence. And so we find that, yeah, so if, if you're going to find a main sequence, you always got the lower end, and then sometimes you have more and more and more and more, and that's how it works, and that's true. That's right. In reality, that is how clusters really work. And then, of course, well, hey, now we have a method of dating the age of a cluster. How old is a cluster since its stars form? Well, we look at this, what we call this the turnoff point on the main sequence. It's the end of that, and I say, okay, so these stars are the ones that are getting ready to leave, and okay, based on this math, this mass, this amount of fuel, I can then calculate and say, aha, these stars would be getting ready to leave the main sequence after... 3 billion years, and then I can calculate. And so for all these different star clusters in the sky, I can calculate what their ages, what the ages of all these different clusters are. And that tells me that, hey, my theory actually has a clue. We really do, we are, really are understanding this nuclear fusion business that's going on deep inside the stars. So whenever you form a cluster of stars, you always form a full main sequence. You have the, the, those, those hot, hot, high luminosity stars, you have the low luminosity stars. Now the low luminosity stars are very, uh, are, are very numerous. Numerous. Uh, yeah, they're, they're very common. There are tons and tons of those. And then these are very rare stars. But these upper end main sequence stars are, you know, those, they, they, they exist, but there are very few of them. Okay, so then the next question is, well, what about the rest of the main sequence? What's about the rest of the HR diagram? Here's the main sequence. Here's your white dwarf stars. Here's your red giant stars. And here's your super giant stars. What's, what, what does that tell us about these? Well, it means that the main sequence is where stars are doing nuclear fusion in their cores. Hydrogen to helium and other places must not be doing that. And so what we find is that up to these supergiant stars, these are all turn out to be very massive stars, very massive, and we find that they are doing other types of nuclear fusion. They finished off their hydrogen and now they're polishing off the helium and then they burn the helium into other elements and they can make neon and silicon and all these other elements. Very massive. They're doing other types of fusion. We find that these red giant stars, again, they're not doing nuclear fusion in their cores anymore. They've, they've used up all the, the hydrogen in their cores. They've built up a core of pure helium. But there is some hydrogen surrounding that, so they're kind of burning the dregs of that. They're burning the remains of that, and that causes a star to go kind of unstable. It swells up enormously, its surface cools, and then... So this is kind of what happens to a star in the later sequences of its life. Again, we can do it theoretically, where the theory matches what we see with our telescopes, and so a star becomes... So, so these are burning the burning they can be burning hydrogen to helium but not directly in the core but in kind of a shell around that in the shell around that and so this is burning the last of their fuel we find that when we study white dwarf stars that these are doing no fusion at all no fusion that those stars are are just the leftover cores of stars that have died they burned up all their fuel they're done with that and so they leave this leftover inert core of a star which then matches up with what we observe as these white dwarf stars and so understanding nuclear fusion in that process is the rosetta stone it unlocks the key so that we can understand all these different types of stars